I'm doing a response video today on an interchange that took place a few months back between Gavin Ortland and Ken Ham. Gavin, uh, I guess, uh, took issue with some tweets that Ken Ham, a young earth creationist, he's the, uh, I guess, CEO or something of Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter uh, Museum in Kentucky. Uh, he uh, tweeted about uh, Gavin Ortland's stance on creation, and I guess we could say old earth creationism. Uh, Gavin, um, who I, I love much of what he does. In fact, this is in no way uh, a slam uh, on him. Uh, I, I think he, he really contributes a lot to the kingdom of God. I'm very impressed with his uh, academic um, understanding and the way that he presents himself and handles lots of different issues. I'm thankful for his work on Protestantism versus Roman Catholicism and orthodoxy and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but when it comes to creation, especially the six days of creation that we see in the book of Genesis, I uh, sharply disagree. And, and this is really an appeal, not just to uh, him, uh, but also to anyone else out there who is a Christian, who is a pastor, uh, and who does not embrace uh, basically a, a literal interpretation of Genesis chapter 1, uh, a global flood, I guess, uh, maybe a little bit more specifically, but uh, let's just, you know, for the sake of argument today, package all of those things together. So uh, let's jump right into that interchange that he had between himself and Ken Ham, and then I'll go from there and explain why this is more of an important issue than many would make it out to be, and why there really is only one faithful interpretation to Genesis chapter 1. There was something that Ken Ham said that I think it's worth interacting with. It represents kind of just a nub of, of where, we, where, where, we, where we differ. So I'll start at the beginning of his post because there was a, a point of agreement right out of the gate. He starts off saying, articles appeared recently in various news sources about theologian Gavin Ortland and his belief that scripture teaches Noah's flood was just a local event. He lists some examples and he says, the news articles reminded me of this verse, there is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. It was amazing to me that the articles and various responses on social media seem to suggest his views are a big new controversy. But certain theologians claiming Noah's flood was local and not global is nothing new. He talks, he goes on talking about it, huh? and he says this is false teaching we've been opposing for a while. But it was actually <laughs> kind of therapeutic to say, like, oh, thank you, Ken Ham. Uh, this is what I've tried to help people understand as well. I continue to think that a lot of the responses about the whole flood issue, uh, I try to say this respectfully, but I guess I think I just need to say this. I think a lot of the, I, I need to say it because of the level of, um, whew, just the way it comes at you. Not all, but a lot of them I just think are just sh coming out of sheer ignorance. They just have not ever studied this. They've not looked into it. They're just sort of reacting emotionally and instinctively based upon what they've all been familiar with in their little orbit, but they've never, you know, someone like Machen. They've never picked up a book by him. Or I mentioned Bavink, you know, Herman Bavink, the great Dutch Reformed theologian, and just have talked about how you know, when he gets to the local flood, he says the, the universal versus local question has always been debated. And then, and he's right, and I've given examples, Josephus, Pseudo-Justin, etc., in my previous videos on that, the, the flood issue. But he also says the, the, the modern global flood view is also a response to modern geology. It's changed as well. So anyway, I've been through all that there. But Ken Ham is right about this. You know, this is not a new issue, the local flood thing. But here's what he then said. So then he's he, he's criticizing me and saying, I, I start with the fact that I'm committed to millions of years, and that drives my reading of, of Genesis. And, um, and then, so here's what he says. Here's the crucial paragraph. What Ortland does to the Genesis text is eisegesis, driven by his commitment to an old earth universe. What we do at Answers in Genesis is exegesis, starting with scripture and letting the word speak to us in context. We don't impose ideas from outside of Scripture as Ortland does. I'm going to show you uh, as we move along, as soon as I uh, let this, this clip play out, uh, how I think this is actually a fair criticism of Ortland's view. And really, anyone who doesn't uh, take a uh, – uh, here he's talking about the flood, but I think a literal understanding – uh, generally speaking, uh, not just of Genesis chapter 6, but also of Genesis chapter 1 uh, and the creation account, why I think this is important. Uh, and I think, honestly, uh, there's there's no 
honest way uh, to do otherwise. But uh, let's continue. So um, here's the here's the basic concern. Uh, if I could sum it up in one sentence, I would say, can Ham and others that he represents who have a similar perspective tend to make their interpretation of Genesis 1 of equal authority with the text itself? They seem to be functioning as though their reading of the text is itself infallible, just as we agree the text itself is infallible. Because if you say, you know, basically, I'm doing exegesis, you're doing eisegesis, which is a way of saying, I'm getting my view from the text, you're importing your view onto the text. That is both projecting a motive onto the other party, as well as being naive about your own influences. I think this is actually a valid criticism of Scripture as a whole and the way different people might interpret it, because uh, there's honestly no way to not read our own cultural understandings of things onto a 2,000-plus-year-old biblical text that we're engaging. Um, If you've never seen yourself doing this, or the church that you attend doing this, or or Christians doing this in, in our day and age, uh, then, then you haven't been a Christian very long because it, it, it happens all the time. However, uh, I've come to the conclusion after having been one of those people who studied this issue for a number of years, I mean, 30 years, I don't know if that qualifies for long enough in his view, but um, that there just is no other honest way to take Genesis chapter one. Um, and, and really to say that the ancients took it any other way is uh, uh, misguided. Because every act of interpretation involves our our fallible brains. Nobody takes the text of Scripture, the infallible text of Scripture, and just, you know, dumps it into our mind or something like that. None of us can bypass the process of thinking about what it means. And yet it seems like Ken Ham wants to sort of give his own view a pass, but I'm not just trying to respond just to get into it with him. I think this is a huge issue, maybe the, the root issue on these questions. People are assuming that there's only one possible faithful way to read the text. So let me respond to that and explain why I don't think it's true that I'm imposing the idea of an old earth onto the text, or I'm committed to millions of years, and that's why I'm reading the text this way. That's the conclusion I have derived, not my starting point that I impose. So... But you have to ultimately take outside influences and impose those on the text. I'll, I'll show this uh, in, a, in a minute here as we continue. But in order to arrive at any conclusion other than this was a literal six-day creation, uh, you have to take outside influences and uh, rationale, reasoning, logic, uh, uh, you know, a, a modern uh, scientific uh, scientific <laughs> concepts such as evolution and impose them on the text. Because I, I just don't think that any uh, sane uh, person would have interpreted it that way historically. Um, there have been different ways, different things people have done with it. Um, but those things, as I'll show you in a few minutes here, have all been uh, the result of outside cultural influences when the people of God, the Jews, or uh, in particular the Christians, once the Judeo-Christian worldview began to spread into the Roman world and beyond, that's where you see a lot of these different ideas about creation accounts creeping in. Uh, My basic position that, that I get from the text of Scripture to the best of my awareness all of us are fallible in this, and we, we're not always even aware of our background presuppositions and so forth. But basically, my, uh, my, my view that I've arrived on is that, that the Scripture just doesn't tell us how old the universe is any more than it tells us its exact size or, or the placement of our world within our galaxy or other questions like this. There's so many questions the Bible doesn't answer. It's not universal in its interests. Uh, and that's, again, extremely common sentiment among 19th century and 20th century fundamentalists, even. Lots of people looked at Genesis 1, 1 through 2, the first two verses, and said, this looks like it's before day one. Therefore, we can't really say how old the world is. Uh, I'm not saying that's correct. I'm saying that's extremely common. But the, the things like that and, uh, and other features in the text are what lead me to my view. So far as I can tell, I'm not starting with millions of years. I'd be happy to believe anything about that. I'm just trying to read the text faithfully. 
Um, there's lots of features in the text I'll cover in just a moment. Some of the ones that were big for Augustine are also significant for me, the light before luminaries issue. Okay, so why is this an important issue? Uh, I, if anybody knows me, you've been following my channel for any length of time whatsoever, you know that I post a lot of videos on the creation debate. Uh, in, in particular, I try to spend a lot of time disproving evolution, uh, scientifically, which is one place that I didn't feel Ortland addressed in his uh, different videos that he did on this because uh, he, he posted originally a video on, uh, I think it was why uh, the flood was a regional, not a global event. And then, uh, you know, that some of that led into this uh, different uh, interchange that he had with Ken Ham. But uh, to me, this is a very, very important issue. Uh, in fact, if I, I look at a lot of what's going on in our world today, uh, biblical skepticism, these kinds of things, um, I, I would actually trace a, a lot of the skepticism that we have in our culture in regard to the Bible, in regard to Christianity, back to um, certainly there, there have been worldly philosophies around before evolution came to be 150 years ago, but evolution is such a big, big deal. I mean, it's, it's really ingrained as scientific fact in our kids from the time that they're born. I, they're, they're going to school and they're learning about evolution in, you know, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Uh, I have a, a, a son who's uh, going to be a sophomore this year at uh, local high school and I remember having some of these conversations with him. He goes to public high school, high school excuse me. But uh, I remember having some of these conversations with him as he was growing up and, um, you know, about why uh, evolution is, is not a proven uh, science. It, it, uh, it, millions or billions of years are, are not proven for the earth. In fact, there's a lot of um, scientific evidence that uh, proves otherwise. But getting back to my original point, why this is an important issue and why when you listen to a guy like Gavin Ortland, um, who's definitely an academic, an accomplished academic, he does a lot of great things for the kingdom of God and other people, William Lane Craig, um, uh, Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy, who has, I've seen debate people on this issue. Um, they're taking a lot of things for granted. They're taking a lot of um, things as facts, uh, evolution. They're taking... Um, they're taking certain fossil finds as facts. Um, I, I, I've actually interviewed people who uh, discredit uh, the supposed ape men that have been presented to us as evidence for evolution. Um, you can actually go back and, and look at some of those videos uh, that I've shown on my channel. Um, if you want more evidence or if you just want to dig deeper into the, into the topic, but, uh, also just see that maybe the evidence isn't as reliable as you think it is. Uh, certainly there was a motivation, not just with Darwin, but with many other people historically over the last 150 years to dethrone Moses and the Bible and our culture. I think successfully it's undeniable, excuse me, historically it's undeniable that they have been successful in what they have set out to do. Uh, that's had a, a very devastating collateral effect on, on our culture. I think one of the dangerous, dangerous things about uh, evolution is that it teaches us that we came from animals. Uh, it really undercuts the, the Genesis narrative as a whole. Um, I, I mean, just from the, from the introductory pages, it, it does that. And so from there, uh, I think you really run into problems. You, you run into problems with people wanting to accept the Bible as just, you know, something that is historical. Uh, was Jesus a historical person? Um, I, I think that it, it opens the door for all of these things. And I know that people will say, well, it doesn't have to, but, it, but I think it has, and I think it does. I personally think a reasonable person will look at the culture around us and we'll see that, we'll come to some of these same conclusions and see that, that what I'm saying is true. I, I think that's a very um, baseline uh, reasonable uh, observation to make. I, I, it's it's not crazy. It's not just sort of sensationalistic. Uh, you know, it's not slippery slope fallacy, anything like that. I, I think it's undeniably true. I, I think if you look at a lot of the scientific disciplines and some of the movers and the shakers and them, even in the area of politics, Karl Marx, uh, Charles Darwin, um, Sigmund Freud in the area of psychology, sociology, that kind of stuff, uh, these people are are ungodly people who uh, made no bones about trying to 
dethrone Jesus as the king of our culture in the West. And uh, in, in large degree, they've been successful. It, it, when it's all said and done, they, they will have failed miserably. But, um, you know, at least in the, in the present time, that's kind of what we're facing in this culture. And so that's why it is an important issue. You know, a, a lot of times people uh, like the ones that I just mentioned will present this as though, you know, it's kind of a smorgasbord. Like you can, it's a buffet. You can kind of pick and choose your theology and what you want to believe. And, and it's, you know, definitely acceptable to believe in millions of years because, uh, you know, people have had different thoughts on creation historically. Certainly that is true. In fact, one of the people that Gavin Ortland mentions in his video is St. Augustine. Uh, he actually shows you this quote, this uh, specific quote from St. Augustine, and talks about how he had an issue with Genesis chapter 1 and light before luminaries. So in his literal commentary, <laughs> no pun intended, on Genesis, he said, When we reflect upon the first establishment of creatures in the works of God, from which he rested on the seventh day, we should not think either of those days as being like these ones governed by the sun. In other words, they're not seven literal days such as we understand them now. So right off the rip, evolutionists are going to say, well, look, that opens the door for millions or billions of, year, of years, epochs of time, you know, maybe day age theory kind of stuff here, right? Okay, but let's continue nor of that working as resembling the way God now works in time, but we should reflect rather upon the work from which times began, the work of making all things at once, simultaneously. Now, I should mention that sometimes it is hard to really tease out a person's beliefs because a lot of times they change. Like if, if you looked at some of the things I believed when I first went into ministry 25 years ago uh, versus today, and then probably versus when I die, hopefully at, at some distant point in the future, uh, there's, there's change on eschatology, there's change on soteriology, there's change on creation. There was a day when I really entertained the idea of a local flood. There was a day when I really entertained the uh, introductory chapter of Genesis not being literal. So we have to keep that in mind when we uh, are approaching historical theology of a person. Nonetheless, St. Augustine does say here that God created things instantly. So uh, I, I think one thing that we can't do when we approach this text, uh, because I've seen people say, well, I can believe in millions of years because St. Augustine deviated from the literal six-day creation. Yeah, but St. Augustine also believed that God created things instantly in working order. At least that's what he appears to be saying from the quote that we just read. So the idea of deep time in creation really does not appear in force until about 150 years ago with Charles Darwin and evolution. So in that sense, yes, anybody who believes in deep time, anybody who believes in evolution, and we're trying to work that into the text of, of Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 2 and, and, and Genesis chapter 6 with the idea of a flood, we are imputing that on the text, I, I think that that is an undeniable fact. Historically, we have to come to see that it would be very difficult for the ancients, and, and I'm not talking even about uh, ancient Christians, so to speak, but specifically the ancient Hebrews, because if, if we're talking about what did the ancients believe about this text, would they have believed, like St. Augustine, that God created things instantly? I doubt it. I think they would have believed the ancient Hebrews, Moses, the people who were reading this originally. Uh, and if, if this did come from at least Genesis, the book of Genesis, hypothetically, did come from some extant text that was handed down to Moses from somebody else, hypothetically, uh, then they as well, I, I think, had to see this as six literal days. The entire basis of the work week is dependent upon God's acts in creation. In reform circles, we say that the Sabbath is part of a creation ordinance. It even, in a sense, precedes the Ten Commandments because it's something that God did in the beginning. And I think the ancients would have understood this literally. 
that, that there's no other way you can reasonably say they would have understood it. If you do want to talk about Augustine deviating from a literal six-day creation, which again is not at all the same as a modern day age theory or evolution or that kind of stuff, he still really falls into the camp of a young earth creationist because he sees God as creating things all at once. In fact, if there was anybody who saw millions or billions of years in the text, it was the Greeks, the pagan Greeks, because their philosophers believed that the universe was eternal. So the point that I'm making here is that it is not an apples to apples comparison to look at modern theories of origins with millions and billions of years in evolution and compare them to some of the slight deviation that we see from a literal six-day creation perspective. I think the overwhelming majority of Christians and the Jews that preceded them that came before the 1850s when Darwin published his Origin of the Species would have fallen accurately within the realm of what we today call Young Earth Creationists. Here's another quote by Irenaeus. He is a second century disciple of Polycarp, uh, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, who takes the six days of creation and applies them allegorically while still holding to a literal six-day creation. Take a look here. For as in as many days as the world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. Okay, so he's basically taking the six days of creation, which he sees as literal, for in as many days as the world was made, the world was made in six days, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason, the scripture says, thus the heaven and the earth were finished and all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day, the works that he had made And God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. This is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years. This is kind of an important scripture here. I'll explain it in a moment. But And in six days, created things were completed. So he's a literal six-day creationist, young earth creationist. It is evident, therefore that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. Okay, so one of the interesting things about this particular quote of Irenaeus is that it doesn't just reveal creation and origins, but it also reveals eschatology. So not just a study of beginning, but a study of ends. And what had come to be an understanding of those six literal days of creation— and actually seven days with the seventh day of rest— as a prophetic image of— 7,000 years that would complete history. Now, some of my studies of end times had led me to the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, which is like the book of Enoch, Jubilees, uh, uh, Esdras, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And one of the interesting things in there is that you see the idea put forth that the lifespan of Adam which was almost a thousand years. One of the interesting things about this quote from Irenaeus actually has a lot to do with eschatology. And I I know we're kind of talking about origins today, but believe it or not, there's a link with what Irenaeus is talking about here and the millennium that you see referenced in Revelation chapter 20. And that's a whole nother video on that, right? Uh, what is the millennium? Um, I'm, I'm only pointing this out to you to show you what specifically Irenaeus is talking about and to emphasize the fact that despite his eschatology, he still was a six-day creationist. And let me take a quick sidetrack just for a second to show you what I'm talking about. Now, this quote is from the Book of Jubilees. It was found in and among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's an intertestamental book of the Bible, uh, not considered scripture by people, but it it at the very least represents these traditions that would have been handed down from the Jews. A lot of people think that the people in Qumran were the uh, expelled Zadokian priests, and whether that's true or not, I don't know, but nonetheless, interesting that what seemed to emerge in Jewish culture in that intertestamental period was this idea that 
the world would have 7,000 years of history. So check out what's written here. Adam died and all his sons buried him in the land of his creation. And he was the first to be buried in the earth. And he lacked 70 years of 1,000 years for 1,000 years are as a day. Now remember that scripture in the Psalms. In the testimony of the heavens and therefore was it written concerning the tree of knowledge on the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. For this reason, he did not complete the years of this day, for he died during it. So I don't know if you see what I'm getting at here, but there's this seems to be this Jewish interpretation of the scriptures that leads to the eschatological idea of the millennium we see presented in Revelation chapter 20. And again, just real quick, here's another example of what I'm talking about so I can drive this point home for you. Now, this is from Second Enoch. We're not exactly sure when this was written. It just illustrates what I was talking about. But here we read, And I appointed the eighth day also, this is God talking to Enoch, that the eighth day should be the first created after my work, and that the first seven revolve in the form of, of the seventh thousand, and that at the beginning of the eighth thousandth year, there should be a time of not counting, endless, with neither years, nor months, nor weeks, nor days, nor hours. And now, Enoch, all that I have told you, all that you have seen on the earth, and all that I have written in books by my great wisdom. So just take a look at this real quick. Now, remember, trace this back, go back to the intertestamental period. We see this idea that based on the lifespan of Adam, that a day is as a thousand years. And I explained the rationale to that for you. You can go back to that quote or rewind the video if you want and take a look at that. And now we see advancing forward a little bit. We see this idea that there's these periods of thousands. And, you know, go back to the quote by Irenaeus that uh, in so many days, in so many thousands of years, the earth shall conclude. These ideas, I think, are instrumental in the concept of the millennium. In the millennial kingdom, we see in Revelation, the ancient Jews would have seen the millennium that we see referenced there as the final day of the week. It would be the day when Messiah comes and he establishes his kingdom. Now, uh, regardless of where you are eschatologically, I do think we see scripturally Jesus establishing a kingdom when he came, the kingdom of God. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We're bringing God's kingdom to earth. I think the idea of Revelation chapter 20, in other words, what, what John is saying, because he's been influenced by the, this undercurrent of Jewish teaching, this foundation of these interpretive traditions, is that Christ's kingdom has come. We are reigning with him in his millennial kingdom. I think that's the idea behind Revelation chapter 20. And I I think this is the intellectual pool that it's drawing from when we see it written there. Yes, John sees this in a vision and he writes it down, but I think that's the point of it. And that's the way the ancient Jews would have understood it. Having said all of that, Irenaeus's statement about six days of creation and eschatology has everything to do with his view of the coming world, and it is not in any stretch suggesting that he is seeing deep time in Genesis chapter 1. I think that's clear from the context of his quote. And, you know, let's take a look at another ancient, Josephus. Josephus writes in his Antiquities, Accordingly, Moses says that in just six days the world and all that is therein was made, and that the seventh day was a rest. Now, you don't see anywhere in the antiquities sort of a uh, concession or anything like that, that there may be a different way of seeing this. Josephus seems to be about the work of cataloging Jewish history. And if you read this, the introduction to his antiquities, there's never a point where he sort of explains that there's another way of seeing it. And why would he? I really don't think there is any logical, rational way to say that the ancients, this isn't a matter of what did Augustine say? Again, Augustine was a young earth creationist. It's not a matter of what did Augustine say? It's not a matter of what did Irenaeus say? It's not a matter of what Josephus said. 
It's really a matter of what did the ancient Israelites think? That was the original audience of this, the original context. How would they have understood those words? It doesn't, it's not what would Philo say, you know, who Philo was a contemporary of Jesus who seemed to have a metaphorical understanding of Genesis chapter one, like he was an Alexandrian, um, that there was a school of thought there heavily influenced by the Greeks and their understanding of the eternal age of the universe that kind of stuff. How would the ancient Jews, the ones that walked with Moses on the road from Egypt, who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, you're going you're to honestly tell me that those ancient Jews and Moses himself and, and his predecessors and the patriarchs, they would have understood this to be anything other than six literal days. Again, they based their whole work week off this thing. And the whole idea is that it's because it's what God did. Uh, another interesting thing you find in the intertestamental literature is that, uh, and the Christians pick up on this too, you see some of this in the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews are patterning a lot of their stuff, the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, all, all these different things. They're patterning that off of these heavenly copies, and the same thing applies to the work week. God literally created the world in six days, and he literally he didn't have to, but he did rest on the seventh to set an example for us. And I think that's how we should see these things. And just for the fun of it, I wanted to fact check myself. And I actually asked Google, was Josephus a young earth creationist? Here's the answer it gave me. Yes, as Google says, some young earth creationists point to Josephus' use of genealogies in his text as evidence that he believed the earth was less than 7,000 years old. Now, if you go on and you read his genealogies, what you see is that, you know, he wasn't putting gaps in there. He wasn't doing day-age stuff. He just he just took this stuff literally. You know, I, I think there might be some conjecture about whether Josephus believed in a local or regional flood, but Let's talk about the flood for a second. Now, I think there might have been some conjecture about whether Josephus believed in a local or global flood, and we'll talk about the flood in one second. But I want to also point out to you another passage of Scripture that I think answers the issue Augustine had. This is one of the things that Ortland brings up in his video. Augustine had an issue with light before luminaries. Just sort of this logical, you know, thing. How, how do you get light in Genesis? God says, let there be light, and there's light. How does that happen? But he doesn't create uh, the sun on that day. So how is, how is that possible? So Augustine had a problem with this. I don't think the ancient Hebrews had a problem with it. I don't think the other writers of Scripture had a problem with it. You know, John wrote this in Revelation. And we forget this. Let's, let's actually take a look at what another Hebrew, an author of Scripture, an ancient Hebrew who lived, he was he enculturated as a Hebrew. He, he said this, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. What, what do you think, what idea, what, what place in Scripture do you think this vision, John, could be sort of going back to, to receive his inspiration from, his thought process from? This is one of the points that Ortland makes in his video. Nobody just comes at Scripture like a blank, a blank slate. We're all bringing sort of our cultural ideas into the text. What cultural idea was John bringing into this scripture we're reading about in Revelation? What do you think? You know, because Revelation is sort of a, a book of endings. It's a book of the eternal state, the new Jerusalem, things, life as it was meant to be. And here he's saying, in eternity, there will be no sun, yet there will be light. Hmm. What other place do we see this take place in scripture? We see it take place in Genesis chapter 1. And now to the flood issue. So we have an ancient author taking Genesis, in, in a Hebrew, I think in, in an authority, authoritative one at that. He was one of the apostles of the Lord, and he wrote Scripture. Uh, he takes, he see, appears to take Genesis chapter 1, uh, the days of creation, literally. Now to the flood issue. Was it, was it regional? Was it... Uh, global. I am not convinced of the flood uh, being global from a biblical perspective. I'm convinced of it being global from a scientific perspective. When you look at the strata of rock layers that we see and the dead things buried in them, and, and honestly, Ken Ham, he's not a theologian, right? But I think he gets this point right because it's obvious. He says, what would you expect to see if you 
saw, uh, if, if the flood was a global event, you would see layers of rock laid down by water and dead things buried in them all over the earth. What is it that you see when you look at the rock strata? You see layers of rock laid down by water and dead things buried in them all over the earth. I, I probably just butchered what he said, but it's just a simple point. When you look at the rock strata, it's sedimentary rock. You go stand at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you look up, it's all sedimentary rock. As fantastical as it sounds, that all of that geological column was produced by water. All of those fossils in the ground, the, the oil reserves that we have, the, the, the fossil fuels that we have in the ground, it was all produced by rapid burial. I know it sounds fantastical, but how do evolutionists produce those rock layers? How do they produce those sedimentary rock layers? They do it with like six or seven global floods. Look into it. What's more reasonable? One or six or more? We don't know. I think they have no idea. Yeah, there's some other things to consider. You know, how, how does distant starlight reach us and so on? Like, you know, there's some issues there with the first three days of creation, which none of which makes me want to step away from a literal six-day creation. If I'm looking at it from the text or if I'm looking at it from science, I think that you have to import millions of years to the text. That was my whole point and why I felt like it was necessary to address this. Just kind of concluding right now, uh, this is an important issue. And I, I don't think that it's one of those things that the church can afford to just sort of take a buffet style approach to. I really want to encourage you to look at some of the other videos I've produced on this topic, uh, see how you line up with some of the information that I present to you about the, the lack of credible missing links, about the uh, geological column, uh, about how it really seems like that was produced by a global flood. The fact that every ancient culture has some kind of ancient flood story. Maybe this thing is real. <laughs> maybe it happened. Maybe it explains everything. And maybe because of that, because of the science we can actually just take God's word as it seems we should instead of bringing our own meaning into it. I think if the culture can do that, I, th this is a battle worth fighting for the church. Because if we can go to a secular world and say, look, there was a flood. Oh, there's a book that talks about a flood. And oh, that book says that the world was flooded for a reason. All of a sudden, it's we're, the Bible is a much more credible thing. And so are the things that it says about salvation. Uh, that's that's my main point I wanted to make today and why I think this is an important issue. I hope that you consider it. Uh, again, friends, uh, God bless you. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like and subscribe. I'd greatly appreciate it. It, it helps me and the ministry out quite a bit, but I hope this conversation was a fruitful one for you. Um, definitely things worth considering. I hope you will give it a fair shake. With that, God bless you, and I will see you in the next video. Peace. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and to sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign and a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes.